Thanks for having us, Mansa. It's sure. great to be here. Um, thanks for coming this morning. Um, so yeah, Etienne and I have been working together since 2013 on a variety of projects that look at the history of natural history um, from different angles, from, from the angle of the infrastructure of knowledge uh, processes, colonial histories. Um, Etienne is based in Jakarta in Indonesia and, s and I'm based in Berlin and so we've um, been very interested in looking at natural history as a colonial enterprise with a specific focus on um, Southeast Asia, um, 19th, 18th and 19th century um, exploration histories. And today we wanted to present you a series of projects that we did that um, center around our sp special affinity for birds and ornithology, um, but that also look at um, the mediatization of animals in an exhibition and scientific, scientific context. And so we've um, divided the presentation into three parts. Each of those um, take their point of departure in a historical case study from the mid-19th century until contemporary times. So one from 19th century, one from the 20th century, and one from the uh, 21st century. Um, the main character is the bird of paradise, you could say. Um, and through that genealogy over three centuries, um, we want to talk about the changing modes of capture of those birds. So it's also a, media, a, a question of, of media and media images. Um, and so one of the, so in the life and death, necroaesthetics, life and death of natural history, so one of the tension points in this history of natural history, exploration of ours, um, and in exhibition making, is the spectrum of the de so the, the live animal in the wild or in, the, in, in nature, and then the moment of capture that can end in a deanimation, so in the death of the animal, and then the reanimation of that animal in whatever um, display context or narrative context uh, it might find itself in later. And so what is um, important to stress with this image up on the screen right now is that, of course, um, the natural history specimen which we encounter in the museum context is not the animal itself. It's already an artifact. It's a, it's a combination, a hybrid of natural material and human-made interpretation. And this interpretation and reanimation in that way has, of course, also a very long history. And in the context... Can I just add something yeah. before you move on? Sure. Happy Earth Day, everyone. <laughs> Um, <laughs> happy Earth Day, everyone. Thank you, you too. Okay. Um, I, I think it's important just also to, to mention <coughs> uh, that it's very nice to have the invitation to talk about this work from Vincent and Tristan, but that we'll put in some concepts. Okay, so you guys know Latour, animation, the animation, these questions animating the lab, but a lot of this comes out of for us less about the theoretical elements which we of course are interested in but from an observation of museum culture and display culture in a very uh, fundamental uh, empirical way um, both working in the back of the collections and also just attending to the display culture so this is from the natural history museum in tasmania in australia but this is not like an accidental moment this is like an intentional display to show the visitor that the animal itself is being produced. So you have the, the halfway production point of uh, the generation of the specimen and then here it's in this sort of bondage moment of acupunctural bondage uh, element preparing itself for its life as a specimen. But that in a way by foregrounding the uh, artifactual quality of the specimen, then the 
maneuver of reanimation is even more interesting because you're showing the process of the material montage and then showing that it still works. And so there's something quite interesting, I think, especially with birds, because obviously birds are hard to hold in one place to study. And so in the, in the um, reanimation of the bird, there is often this sort of sequencing of the bird as being rendered specimen as part of the display, not something in the back of house, which then makes this whole presentation even more um, kind of an odd place for, for thinking uh, necroaesthetics. So the presentation of death as a, f as a particular epiphenomenon of aesthetic apprehension. Yeah? Um, this is an image that I particularly like. This is uh, by Conrad, is a drawing um, of a bird of paradise by Conrad Gesner, who was a Swiss polymath of the mid 16th century. Um, and so adding to what Etienne just said about the production of the taxidermy bird specimen, the techniques for that and the sustainability of those objects wasn't um, developed until quite late, actually. And as, as uh, Philippa said, the Natural History Museum, as we know it, as a public institution, arrives quite late. And up until that point, ornithologists and scientists experimented tremendously with different modes of, of conservation and lasting preservation of, of bird specimens. Um, but in the in the 16th century, birds of pair there was no ta no arsenical soap yet, which then allowed for um, collections to last for a long time. This came in the 18th century. So in the mid mid 16th century, what had just happened was um, that in 1522, Magellan's boat returned from Indonesia from the Spice Islands, and they brought the first five uh, bird of paradise specimens from that area um, to the French. French court, if I remember correctly, Spanish court. Um, and these birds had chopped off wings and they had no feet and nobody had ever seen them alive anyway. And so an intense mythology around these birds um, arises. Nevertheless, they had still quite beautiful plumage, as you can maybe imagine here. This is a little bit scraggly, but um, at the same time, imagine this arrives and it's, um, it raises a tremendous um, sense of curiosity. And so in a mixture of um, passed on mythology from Asia and religious beliefs um, from Europe, this mythology is created around these birds where um, the story goes that they, because they have no feet and no wings, well, but they are birds, where the birds are in the sky, so they can, they, they just live there and they never land and they only come to earth uh, when they when they when they die when they when they're dead, um, and so in this story in this genealogy because the the three case studies that we are presenting deal with the capture of bird of paradise. So it, this is the first image that um, is before we have a three dimensional um, relation to this object, where um, in 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 the early hi history of ornithology the book is really the is really the space of of capture. And it's a, these images are pastiches of, narr of different narratives and accounts because often the ornithologists wouldn't have seen um, the, the objects first, firsthand. They would just produce them uh, out of narration. Um, and so there's just, just to, as a preamble, um, in relation to the meaning, the contemporary significance of these historical collections also, there's a relationship to the wild and to the birds that is changing um, as we are facing to, um, heavy extinction rates contem in, in contemporary times. Um, and so just to point your, your sense to some of those dynamics, so we've already mentioned exploration and then colonialism, and so here's another, another image from um, the late 19th century where um, Germany had a small, small colony on New Guinea. And so they issued coins, uh, with bird of paradise, on these coins, um, on the money. And that's an image that um, I chose to put here in order to show you the relationship between specimens and economic wealth, colonial exploration in terms of a colonial science and production of knowledge, but a linkage to factors of environmental uh, surveying 
and um, colonial extraction, um, and the kind of unequal um, productions of, of various benefits that are uh, related to that. And then uh, the third image before we kind of go into the three stories, um, so this is an image of an albatross. Albatrosses are currently heavily threatened by um, anthropogenic impact, mostly plastic in the ocean. And so just to, so the, just to um, give you a small, hori a, sh a short horizon uh, on um, the relationship of human and, and bird life. So the dodo is the first, is, is, is this bird that um, is considered the first animal that uh, became extinct in the 16th century through human exposure. So that's an interesting, it's a, it's a bird, it fits in our, our lineage of, of research because it's a, it's a bird um, relation there. Uh, so this is in the 16th century. Uh, current, so currently um, there's a discussion whether we find ourselves in the context of the Anthropocene in what is called the sixth um, mass extinction. And a mass extinction, so extinction, um, death of species happens in evolution, of course, naturally. Um, but in rates where you lose two species in 10,000 species over a thousand years. And currently scientists are considering rate back, this is called background rates, um, between t 100 and 1,000 times increase. So um, since 1900 alone, 477, if not more, vertebrae went extinct. 40% um, of reptiles and amphibians are considered threatened. 17% um, of birds are considered threatened. Um, in Europe, since 1980 alone, so this is not a very long period, agrarian birds, so birds that are in, in, the, in human and anthropogenic landscape of fields, are considered extinct by, by, or, um, by 50% so that the species are just um, diminishing. And so the relationship to museological collections really changes because this is the space where all of a sudden, um, if not in the zoo, you have, a, you have one bird that is left of a, of a species. We'll talk about that later as well. But so the museum becomes a space where the exposure to these species um, somehow is still possible, whereas um, in, out in the out in the land, the conditions are rapidly and radically changing. So this is, um, this is an image in Sumatra, the island to the west of Java. Um, and I would just show this. This is a palm oil um, plantation with a palm oil rendering factory uh, that we're photographing here. Um, and we show this because um, the research that we've been doing around the three projects that we're going to show is not only archival, it's not just in the back of house of natural history museum collections or in collections um, related to those artifacts and their production, but also it trying to look at the field context of, of, of the condition of some of these environments where those collections were um, originally obtained. And so in Sumatra, 25% of the rainforest was converted to palm oil plantation in the last decade alone. So the rate of land use change is quite severe. Um, and trying to understand and document this, of course, is, this is not a place where you're invited to go and photograph the transformation of the landscape. But working with some environmental activists, we managed to get access to this and, and do a number of interviews um, with residents and with, with um, conservationists working in that area. And so just to say that there'll be some moments where we're moving between the archive and the field, which I think is actually quite productive, trying to find what was extracted from this site prior to its transformation. But we're going to present, as Sophie said, three examples of uh, tension between deanimation and reanimation. So the first example will be from the collection of Alfred Russell Wallace from the 1850s and 60s. Um, this is a bird uh, collected by Wallace in the Tring collection of the London Natural History Museum. Um, the second one uh, will be about David Attenborough and capture in film and also capture, it's the same way shooting and shooting, they're capturing on film for the first time but then they also have a team of 100 people caging birds and bringing them back to the London Zoo 
and that will watch the film of this uh, excerpt. Uh, and then in, in each of these, we sort of present our response as curators in, in response to these moments. And in the third, um, we're going to look at a very recent project from the Cornell uh, Ornithology Lab, who we work with, but also have a critical relationship with, um, where they documented for the first time in over a decade, every single bird of paradise in, vi in high resolution video, which then produces a sort of database subjectivity of the birds where you can click through and compare and hear their songs and hear their, hear their, um, uh, and see their, their performances, their um, displays in their mating practices. Uh, and we're going to kind of put that in context of a recent workshop we were doing in the Berlin Natural History Museum with um, Frank Steinheimer, seen here holding a bird of paradise, and look at the relationship between a database collection and the, and the role of narrative in, in moving through natural history. May I just summarize those three points? Um, so Wallace is the first white man considered to encounter birds of paradise in the wild. And so he takes back a large, large, which we'll talk about, large, large collection of um, specimens, um, sends birds of paradise specimens to England for the first time as a scientist. Um, David Attenborough in the mid 50s is the first biologist who captures bird of paradise on moving image. And then uh, Tim Lehman and Ed Scholes in 2008 are the first ornithologists and wildlife photographers to, um, as Ken said, be able to produce um, photographic documentation of all 39. So there's always this, this moment of first mediatization as well as an attempt to always be very complete and comprehensive. Keep going. There you go. Um, so we're going to try to raise also, it's just all three is. You know, this one's for me. So <laughs> it's all threes. Um, the, the, so just to, to also try to look at three lines of questions that are laid in. The first one being, what is the role of colonization in knowledge production? So how was a certain colonial epistemology at play in the production of both the production of the specimen, the production of the display, the meaning of the exhibition, the meaning of the bird as an exemplary case? of uh, colonial knowledge achieving or capturing or sub subsuming its uh, natural evidence. Um, you want to go ahead on this? Yeah, well, the second is um, the question of uh, understanding the relationship of what Tom Van Duren, I have his book here, environmental philosopher Tom Van Duren calls um, AB faunal entanglements. So he urges us to understand extinction or extermination as well as birds or other species, not as separate entities. You you asked that you raised that point about the animal. Who is the animal? Where where, where do we stand? Um, but with AV, with the term AB faunal entanglement, he emphasizes. Um, the relationality, uh, which is both the relationality of, of cause or of responsibility, of care, of loss, um, of impact. And um, so in the sense of deanimation, reanimation, um, to think the position of the human in relationship to species and species change. Um, and the third question, uh, as we are in ECAL, and uh, art, and you're artists, as we heard, and, and we move in between being curatorial and artistic and scientific. Um, so the third question is, um, how does how do contemporary curatorial or artistic agents um, respond to to these these forms of archives? And so we wanted to show you our uh, our attempts to doing that, but we 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 are very excited also to. Um, engage with you in a discussion later and, and see what we can come up with. Um, yeah. So, I mean, philosophically, we could also put this in the problem of inheritance, which is a fairly c consistent problem, uh, modern problem. How do we inherit the collections? How do we inherit the environmental damage that is uh, in parallel to those collections? And how can they be read in relationship to each other not necessarily didactically or with this sort of false causality, but 
-hmm. How do we read environmental transformation and um, specimen collection in relation to one another as, um, a, as a form of inheritance? Correct. And so one more thing about this, just as a note as well. So in an ethnographic museum context, the colonial lineage of these collections is very much understood and is very much addressed. But the colonial, the coloniality of the natural space of the Natural History Museum in the traditional exhibition display context is not thought through or is not ev is not offered normally. And so something which with the following project that we are going to talk about now, but also in general kind of try to raise is um, that sensitivity to these other stories that are embedded or somehow connected to these objects that are normally traditionally read from a biological point of view. Right? To put it really so, bluntly, if you see a bunch of masks of indigenous people in a museum, you assume that they are the result of colonization. But if you see a number of animals stuffed there, they seem to have walked into the museum of their own accord and sat down in some natural display. And so somehow in the human uh, ethnographic collection, we have an immediate association of colonization. And in natural history collections, which we've seen all over, you know, every, we can see anywhere, there's really not such an assumption made. Um, there is some sort of much more there innately naturalized. And very little connections are made to the forms of environmental violence of extraction that are also always connected with ex the exploration of nature in that context. Um, good. So uh, we are entering then in the first chapter of those three chapters, um, centering around the 19th century naturalist and collector Alfred Russell Wallace. 125,660 specimens of natural history is both um, basically the number of specimens that he collected between 1854 and 1862 while he was exploring the Malay Archipelago, but it is also the title of an exhibition that we organized and curated in Jakarta and in Indonesia last year. With, uh, in partnership with the Indonesian Institute of Science and their specimens collection, as well as with uh, local and international artists and with funding from a Berlin Foundation for um, Art and Science projects. Uh, you do the little biographical? No, go ahead. No? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, um, who is Alfred Russell Wallace? A British um, land surveyor originally, who then became, a sp uh, became interested in beetles in his early, early life, early age. Um, and was also already kind of interested in the question of evolution or transmutation of species as it, w as it was called at the time. So this is, um, Darwin uh, has already been to the Beagle while um, Wallace is conceptualizing these questions, how do species come into the world? Um, and he goes to the Amazon uh, with his friend Henry Bates in the 1840s. Uh, collects a vast number of, of specimens as well as mapping um, the Rio Negro and the Amazon. And he's, a, he's kind of a, sole, a lonesome character, so he does these things often by himself, um, not with a large entourage. And this is also because he wasn't a trained scientist. He was a collector, which means he collected to sell, to make money and to survive. Um, nevertheless, because he was very intelligent, he also had these... Um, questions about biology yeah? and, and, and so when he's then in Indonesia, so he loses his um, Amazonian collection, so he, mo he, he goes on another exploration by invitation um, to the Malay Archipelago um, and he has an interest in understanding evolution and so in uh, 18 55, 50, in 1858 he actually uh, achieves to Kind of, it clicks and he understands, based on his collection, he understands that um, species are always closely related to other species and, and, and slowly evolve like this. And so he sends a letter to London um, and Charles Darwin kind of gets, gets um, an air of this. And up, upon um, his publication, his letters from the Malay Archipelago, uh, Darwin publishes The Origin of Species in 1859. Um, while Wallace is over there and they don't know each other and Wallace is 30 years younger. But then, so in um, conventional history of biology, we are taught very much about Darwin, but we are not so aware of the role of the Indonesian geography or the Indonesian biodiversity for the 
understanding and the conceptualization of the theory of evolution. And then in the, in the horizon of the Anthropocene, of course, the theory of evolution and, and all, everything from um, capitalist progress and all of these, Malthus and all of, all of those kind of ideas is very, such a central concept. And so for us, it was very interesting with, with the ten living there and kind of um, exploring contemporary questions of climate change was very interested um, in making a pro interesting to make a project there that that highlights some of those historical lineages. Um, so it seems like we're getting a bit ahead of ourselves. So this is the map of Wallace's travels in the Indonesian archipelago. He's there for eight years and collects 125,000 specimens. So about 40 specimens a day he's sending back, mailing back. Um, and then we've, over the course of three years of research, spent a lot of time looking at both his notebooks in the Linnaean Society, looking at his detail, the, the collection of material, um, and then how that material itself was rendered into scientific knowledge. So. One of the key elements of this, and we'll move quickly through this, but just to make it very clear, his interest in birds is a result of trying to understand the biogeographical distribution of animals. And so if you look at this, between the pink of the Eurasian plate and the uh, Australian plate, there's this fine line that runs between uh, Bali and Lombok, two very small islands right here in Indonesia. And that line is known as the Wallace line. Because of his careful uh, collecting, killing and collecting and itemizing of all of the specimens, he could then determine that there were two evolutionary lines that, that broke at that point. So while the, the geology and geography appeared to be contiguous, biology showed that it was not, right? So there are certain birds on one side that are not found on the other. There are certain primates on one side that are not found on the other. There's no kangaroos in Java, nor are there any orangutans down in Tasmania, right? And so while Wallace is collecting this vast number of species um, and really utilizing this to articulate a theory of evolution by natural selection, as Sophie said, and develop the first theory of biogeographical distribution. Um, it's not until the end of the narrative in his book that he comes to have a bit of doubts. Um, a bit of, and he begins to have some odd reflections about what it is that he's doing. We're currently writing about this uh, for, for a new book uh, which we're, we've called reverse hallucinations, where um, the problem is that while Wallace can see this massive amount of, of killing and what it is leading to, he's constantly also publishing his scientific papers about progress and order and, and a positivist conception of natural history. So I read you this passage, um, which Wallace uh, is near the end of his book, about 500 pages in, he's at just shot his first bird of paradise. And so he knows he's going to be the first European to bring this thing back and be able to tell the story with it's going to have feet, it's going to have wings, he's going to be able to describe it. In the end, it's named after him. Uh, it takes on his name in the taxonomy. And this is his reflection, and I think just it's not so long, but hang in on this because I think it gives a quite interesting texture to collecting for us. I thought of the long ages of the past during which the successive generations of this little creature had run their course, year by year being born and living and dying amid these dark and gloomy woods with no intelligent eye to gaze upon their loveliness. To all appearance, such a wanton waste of beauty. Such ideas excite a feeling of melancholy. It seems sad that on the one hand, such exquisite creatures should live out their lives and exhibit their charms only in these wild, inhospitable regions, doomed for ages yet to come to hopeless barbarism. 
While on the other hand, should civilized man ever reach these distant lands and bring moral, intellectual, and physical light into the recesses of these virgin forests, we may be sure that he will so disturb the nicely balanced relations of organic and inorganic nature as to cause the disappearance and finally the extinction of these very beings whose wonderful structure and beauty he alone is fit to appreciate and enjoy. Uh, a deep uh, schizophrenia in our <laughs> modern scientific <laughs> conception. And so as we followed Wallace's collection. Well, I just want to say, uh, you also you know all those incredible feather costumes of, of native native people in these regions, right? So if he says the, f so just, just needs to be said. Um, but so in our work, um, we have visited many collections looking for the Wallace specimens because at first um, of our, of our um, on the outset we thought, oh yes, let's do a project about these 125,660 specimens of natural history. And then later we learned that, that they are not in, in one place. They are distributed vastly across uh, Europe and to the United States, whereas in um, Southeast Asia itself, there's only a si there's a single bird in the um, Natural History Museum of Singapore that that remained from the collection that remained in the region and everything else um, was sent to scientists in the West. Um, and you go on. Uh, so after uh, maybe, I don't know, 15 or 20 uh, natural history collections tracking Wallace's specimens, um, we came to the realization that we would never, of course, first, we would never track them down uh, in their entirety. Second, that we would um, uh, never, ever have the budget or capacity to bring any of those specimens back to Asia, right? So in developing the exhibition, 125,660 specimens, um, the idea was how do we enlist and enroll the uh, institutions in Indonesia, particularly the Indonesian Institute of Science, with contemporary artists to sort of collide those things in reflection on the collection, colonial history, and contemporary environmental collapse. So uh, we were working with the gallery Salihara, an amazing contemporary art space, an incredibly political contemporary art space in Indonesia, with the idea of bringing, uh, it ended up through an open call to be 13 Indonesian artists and 13 international artists into the collection of the Indonesian Institute of Science and to run those artists through a series of workshops with the natural history scientists and curators uh, so as to expose them to the history of that process and that collection, but also to show um, that, for example, in these uh, Semioptera Wallace, these are the birds named after Wallace, but of course these are not ones collected by him, but part of the collection. And so that we could look through that collection to find its colonial legacy, and then also... Um, allow the artists to have their practices challenged by the exposure to that work. Now, of course, they're not going to start making taxidermies or necessarily utilize that material, but that they would then be challenged by that work. So we loaned specimens for the exhibition in the art gallery, and we also kind of adapted the lab furniture, which we found here in the, this, this is at the uh, Indonesian Institute of Science. We, found, we kind of found this type of furniture and adapted it um, for as the arch as exhibition architecture in our space so that we kind of displaced the natural history collection into this other space, heterotopic space, if you could call it that, um, in order to allow for, for new dynamics and different kinds of sets of stories uh, to intersect. And then so you saw the, you saw the handmade plan and then this is the um, map of the show where um, we ended up with 27 um, tables that we kind of uh, arranged in a, in a, in a quasi-archipelago um, and the display of uh, nearly 200 um, objects ranging from small beetles to a large tiger skin to the artwork 
two historical documents um, from the Linnaean Society in London in, in facsimile, um, two audio recordings, um, UNESCO stamps, a very multidisciplinary um, scenario with art and science objects coexisting together. Um, then we had um, a collaboration with a British uh, photographer, Fred uh, Langford Edwards, who, um, as we said, we couldn't and we didn't want to um, bring the original Wallace specimens back into the into the scenario. But um, Fred's project is to find the original Wallace um, specimens in the collections and make these medium format photographs, which we then uh, displayed in this in this oval space of the show as a sort of horizon line, as the traces of, of these originals, and in the center were the lone specimens from, from um, the Science Institute. And here you can see, so um, uh, Wallace uh, collected about 8,000 birds and uh, discovered 100 species that were up until this point um, not known to science, and so the scientists gave us uh, a drawer. As you can see that here on the left, there will be a better picture. But um, they gave us um, the birds that uh, were discovered by Wallace, and so we arranged them in this. They discovered for science, yeah, of course. Um, so they were um, arranged in in this drawer, and so with the modular architecture of the table, it was possible for us to slide to slide the drawers um, from the Science Institute under these glasses, so they, they gave us the drawers um, from their cabinets and we could show them there. Um, and then on the other side, this is this is art by Ari Bariwaji, an Indonesian artist. And so the, there, there were these direct juxtapositions and correlations um, between those ki different kinds of artifacts. Uh, here you see a lithograph from the Meli Archipelago book published by Wallace, um, which is called Native Shooting Birds of Paradise. And then um, in the next vitrine is a bird of paradise specimen with uh, the letter that Wallace, uh, that Darwin sent back to Wallace in response to that first letter. Um, Ari Bayuwaji's project, so we, the artists were invited to somehow consider the land use transformation or the environmental change um, in, in, in relationship to the accounts from Wallace's book. Uh, from 1869 to, to now. And so Ari um, had, uh, was really struck by the descriptions of the birds of paradise, um, as well as uh, by that image, the lithograph. And so he was in, in Bali on the beach and encountered these trees, and, he and, and his mind was sort of uh, occupied by the, by, by the scenario of birds and the trees, and, but what does he find is only plastic. And so he took a, se a, long, se a long series of, of pictures um, with this plastic um, replacing, replacing these creatures. Um, so this is a taxonomy of palm oil that, that we added as a series of specimens. These are just 100 uh, contemporary Indonesian products that contain palm oil um, and a history of palm oil as an as a agent of change in the land. Um, here you can see some of the specimens that were key specimens that Wallace described in his, in his book in the description of evolution, um, particularly here the, the, this uh, tree frog and the orangutan, which features very heavily in the beginning of the book. Um, this is one uh, photograph of a series of many included by Shannon Castleman. Um, these are a kind of remarkable series of images from Sulawesi where uh, because of the land use change, it is incredibly dangerous to do any logging there. You're immediately in jail. And so communities have come up with ways of sort of crowdsourcing logging trees so that no one ever gets caught. So they leave the ax by the side of the road and every time you drive by, you stop and hit it once and get back on your motorbike. And so she has uh, captured the process of this um, uh, illegal logging as a result of land use transformation in Sulawesi. Um, here, one of the scientific curators from Indonesia with his tiger skin in relationship um, to a, a, a work displaying the history of tigers in Indonesia. 
another work by Equinorth, a collaboration between Indonesia and Norway, looking at the generation of Indonesian nationalism through a park um, in Indonesia, the beautiful little park of Indonesia, how they've collected these iconic architectures of each element in the archipelago to produce a colonial collection of their own population. So, of course, the collecting doesn't end at the animals, but has extended in this regard into a contemporary cultural artifacts. And maybe we just skip through some of these so we can get to the other examples. Of course, to produce a catalog to attend uh, to the show, um, and a bit about public programming. Um, we tried to connect the gallery to the urban ecologies uh, adjacent to it, including the river, which is maybe five, one of the main rivers of Jakarta is about five minutes away. This is about the ground condition character, characteristic there. Sophie's shoes did not make it through that day, unfortunately. That was the last they were seen right here. Uh, and then we brought in some of the scientists to do taxonomy workshops with high school students to really look at the history of conservation and how these animals are preserved. And then a much broader program with uh, young people, getting them to try to interact with some of these things. And many of them, of course, have not seen any of these specimens or, or will not see them in their lifetime in the wild. If you're interested in any of this material, it's all documented in English on the website, although the entire exhibition was produced in Bahasa Indonesian and there was no English text in the actual in, in the show in Jakarta. Um, yeah, and then the pro our pro our work on Wallace and um, goes on, and so we just uh, displayed this taxonomy of Palmer installation a second time at the University of Princeton in an exhibition curated by um, the anthropologist Evan Kirksey, um, where we remade the piece based on um, pro products available on the American market. So in the first instance, it was all things that you buy in Indonesia, and ranges from um, vegetable oil to cosmetics to chocolate to lipstick everything okay so uh, second example we're going to go uh, we're going to go into the film uh, minor ornithology is a project we've been working on for several years it's trying to look at stories within the history of human bird interaction that are not dominant and particularly not scientific but fascinating and illuminating nevertheless. Uh, and so in the context of minor ornithology, we want to put a relationship between, as we said, this capture of the first cinematic capture. So the first time the bird of paradise is captured on film uh, with a young David Attenborough here, uh, charming his way into the BBC to get massive amounts of resources, <laughs> as you'll see. Um, to get his, his um, situation dialed up for this film. So we'll just start, yes? Yeah? yeah. So we wanted to show you this film. Um, we, we'll see in... in uh, we can see if we have to skip. Um, but let's like start and then we can just skip ahead. <laughs> Ah, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. So sorry. There we go. Please don't send any photos of this to the BBC. <laughs> As you may guess, we're not supposed to be showing you. Which will explain any odd noises which you hear. Uh, they will, there's one, they come from the other inhabitants. And I've got with me uh, a hornbill. Do you want to eat? <laughs> Not hungry, I don't think, but this one is one which we've got in central New Guinea. Actually in one of the uh, remotest valleys, the valley of the Jimmy River. He's a very nice creature, he's a, he's a cock bird. Whoa! Don't do that. I think he just uh, lost his footing on my arm. He feeds on, on meat, quite a lot of meat and fruit, and he's done very well. Uh, he seems to be very fit and healthy here. He's only a young bird now, uh, perhaps two or three years old, and he may live to be 30. Soon after we caught this character, 
um, we decided to set off on a journey, a journey to the north. We were to leave the Jimmy River and go up into the foothills of the, this noise, sorry, go up into the foothills of the uh, Bismarck Mountains. Now normally when we go off on trips like this, I usually reckon to travel to the lights, maybe one or two quarters. But this trip was going to be different. We didn't know whether we could get anywhere to sleep, so we had to take tents. We didn't know uh, whether we could get any food, so we had to take all that with us. We didn't know whether the people there were going to be friendly, and so we had to take an armed gun. And when we added all that up, we found to our horror that we were going to have to take 150 porters. The local headmen assembled carriers for us by calling to the tiny farms and homesteads scattered throughout the valleys sending word that we wanted people to come and carry our goods. Soon enough men had assembled and we were able to start off. We marched along a series of grassy ridges which led down towards the Jimmy River itself. It was very hard going. The grass was very high and its leaves extremely sharp so that uh, soon our legs and forearms were covered with lots of tiny cuts which smarted painfully as our salty perspiration trickled into them. It was as hot as I've ever been or ever wished to be. And towards the end of that day, we reached this stream which is one of the tributaries of the Jimmy River. Getting across it was quite tricky. It uh, wouldn't have mattered much if I'd fallen in myself, but I was very worried in case one of the porters should lose his foothold, because these boxes contained, amongst other things, all our film. If that got wet, well, the work of many months would be ruined. This little lad got the tape recorder. And then, five days later, we reached the Jimmy River itself. This is the only place for miles either way where it's crossed by a bridge. Beyond, on the other side, lies uncontrolled territory inhabited by mysterious tribes of pygmies. I was hoping very much that we might be lucky enough to meet them, for hardly anything is known about these people, and to my delight, there were a group of them at the foot of the bridge when we arrived. Most of these men had never before seen Europeans, and understandably they were very shy. A few of them were wearing these extravagant headdresses of cockatoo feathers. They were tiny people, uh, particularly if you discounted their headdresses. I reckon that their average height was about four foot six to four foot eight. Two of them wore at the back of their necks the beak of a hornbill, the bird I've just shown you. The ones in their headdresses were on their way to a celebration, and we couldn't persuade them to stay. Soon, only a few remained, and Barry Griffin, the patrol officer who had come with us, spoke to them through an interpreter. We wish to buy food, he said. Will you send messages to your people on the other side of the river and ask them to bring some food across for us and our porters? The pigments agreed, and that afternoon, more of them began shyly to venture across the bridge, laden with food. This little boy has got a bundle of pantings, and the man is holding a breadfruit. We were both uh, delighted and relieved to see all this food because we had now been on the march for six days and our supplies of rice for the porters were getting very low.
piles of fruit uh, began to grow. And soon we had an enormous quantity. There were taro roots, bananas, plantains, pawpaws, sugar cane, breadfruit, and many other things. When all the pygmies were assembled, uh, Barry Griffin made another little speech. First, he thanked them very much for having brought us so much food so quickly. And then he told them that he was one of the men who traveled in the great noisy machines which they had often seen flying in the sky above their mountains. Although this was his first visit, he said, he would be coming again to see them, so if they would got any troubles, they should bring them to him. Tomorrow, he said, we want to go across the river into your country, and we will pay well for any men who come with us to carry our loads. <laughs> Once the speech was over, the police boys handed out payment for the food. These policemen come from the coast, and they belong to quite different tribes. I imagine the pygmies were almost as astonished to see them as to see us. For well, these policemen must have seemed to be giants. We paid for the food mostly in salt, and the pygmies were delighted to receive a spoonful of salt for a whole pile of breadfruit. Just why they found salt so valuable, we were to discover later on when we crossed the river into their territory. The policeman also offered matches and powder paint, that's in the tin on the right, but it was salt which most of the pygmies wanted. Once the food had been paid for, then the feasting began. I found among the crowd the pygmy who had been Barry Griffin's interpreter. I found that I could just make myself understood to him in pidgin English, and he showed me some of his arrows and his very powerful bow. He was indeed a very good shot. I was particularly interested in the huge wig which many of the pygmies were wearing, and I asked him if I could see what it was made of. The decorations on the top are changed nearly every day. Today it happens to be bits of leaves. Tomorrow it may be flowers or some feathers, or even more likely, uh, the labels from our tins of meat. This is the skin from a cuscus. Now off comes the outer covering of cloth, which is made from beaten bark fibers. Beneath it was this other cloth. And when this came off, I saw a mass of hair matted together with red clay. I asked him if he'd take that off too. And he said, no, I can't, it's me. The wigs seem to me to be pretty awkward things to have permanently stuck on top of your head. They might, I suppose, be waterproof, but I couldn't understand how anyone could sleep in them. But, as you see, the pigments have a solution to that, too. A pole, in fact, is all you need to make your bed. One of the men was drinking from the river, using for a water vessel this stem of bamboo. These people have no knowledge of pottery at all. My interpreter friend had now woken up, and close by him I saw this delightful creature, a cockatoo. It was obviously very tame and was visiting each group begging for food. This is a bit of sweet potato it's asking for now.
The cockatoo is very common hereabouts. We'd heard flocks of them as they screamed above our heads in the forest, and we'd seen those headdresses made from their feathers. This bird, I understood, had been taken as a chick, and so far it had escaped slaughter for the sake of its feathers. The interpreter didn't own the bird, but the man who did brought it along to me. I was captivated. It was very tame and a very affectionate creature, and I decided to try and buy it. I offered its owner a gold lip pearl shell. The pygmy accepted it without even trying to bargain. He was, I think, staggered at my generosity because a gold lip pearl shell is extremely valuable here. But for my part, I thought I'd made a very good bargain. And here is uh, this cockatoo. Uh, actually, she's not an inhabitant of the birdhouse here. Like me, uh, she's a visitor. Um, she's a visitor because I kept her. And she lives at the moment uh, in my warm kitchen at home. I don't suppose there's any real need to keep her there. After all, the, the New Guinea mountains get quite cold. But I don't want to take any risk with such a delightful pet. So I'm going to skip ahead uh, to show you when he's in the Bird of pa Paradise aviary that he's creating. And then we go on with the talk. But that's important that um, you get a sense of this. So here. Here you can see all the cages. So they will have the bird of paradise, the live bird of paradise in here. And the expedition is carrying these cages along for many weeks, right? Um, That's why you need 100 porters to carry back you know, all your goodies. Let me see, where is this? So you, you can here. Let's see. As projecting from it, well, Poppy is uh, one of the largest of the birds of paradise. And here's one of the smallest, uh, the king bird of paradise, which is only a little larger than a robin. Its feathers are brilliant red, except for its white underparts. But the most remarkable thing about the uh, king bird of paradise are those two long wires projecting from its tail. Each of them's got a little green disc on the end of them. Both those uh, wires actually should be the same size. One of them's only half grown. It's a wonderful little bird. So, and then at the very, very end of this episode, as the highlight, is when they capture the birds uh, on the camera in the wild, which is here. And you really, st you hardly actually, um, at least for our contemporary, you hardly think you see it. In anything. preparation for his dance, Charles Lagos and I watch them closely through binoculars and through our telescopic lenses hardly daring to breathe, lest we should scare either of them before his dance began. And now a second hen bird arrives. And then suddenly he flexed his wings and started his dance. In a frenzy of excitement, he threw his ruby plumes above his head, shrieking with excitement. Thank you. 
You'll, you'll see a, a different version of that, but just to, just to say that this then is the first uh, moment um, where that's actually captured on film. Um, so the really quickly, um, and we can talk more about the details of these projects, one of the things that we became quite interested in then is this capture where he says, oh, I, I bought it, I brought it home, and so there's the scientific element and the cinematographic element, but then there's also the sort of, and then I wanted one for myself. Um, and so in Jakarta, they have the, um, one of the largest, if not the largest bird market in Asia, uh, and in the um, Jakarta Biennale in 2013, we were asked to do a project uh, in relation to colonization and science. And so we wanted to look at the bird market, particularly this contemporary space of I an incredible amount of captivity, perhaps the highest density of captivity that one can imagine, uh, and an incredibly high degree of consumption. Um, and with the question of how after Indonesian independence does the, does the bird market change? Does the capturing of birds register a political transformation or not. And so the organization was basically to spend a lot of time uh, in this space uh, with a few of our research assistants um, to begin asking sellers and workers about the history of their role there and then to curate that into a set of 14 different uh, presentations. Uh, we can imagine like artist presentations, but of a certain uh, avifaunal knowledge production. And so we tried to take this kind of incredibly chaotic space uh, with our assistant Robin, map that space and curate a set of stops. And so rather than bringing the bird market to the Jakarta Biennale, we just brought people from the Biennale into a set of curated uh, walking tours where we would stop uh, at different moments in the market to have, um, in this instance, the people who breed the flying uh, pigeons uh, explaining the breeding procedures, um, the guy who fixes everything explaining why he fixes cages the most elegant way and why birds enjoy their captivity in his cage designs. Uh, and then other um, folks who just were interested in a particular type of bird or a particular species and this is kind of incredible intimacy between some of the young people that work there and, and the birds that they care for. Mm -hmm. And so you can find more about this exhibition. We can talk about it. Yeah, we can talk about it. If you have questions, we can talk about it in the discussion. Um, just to say, there's this third chapter coming now, and then we've decided that we'll cut the sort of the philosophical conclusion, and we can move that into the, we can see how we're going to do that in the discussion. Um, so. Little, little Birds, Little Machines, this um, third part, arranges itself around uh, Tim Lehman and Ed Skoll's expedition from 2008 to uh, Indonesia, um, where they photographed with um, funding from National Geographic and the Cornell Lab of Ornithology photographed all the 39 species um, bird of paradise. Um, so to to not uh, have me explain it for you, we're going to show you and, and compare this to uh, the Edinburgh video that you just saw and, and um, think about the progression of uh, nature photography and biological, uh, docu these biological documentaries, right? And this becomes sort of quite, oh, becomes quite evident. Man um, adventurism that is somewhat tamed yes. in its British articulation and then in its American version Ameri just goes full full camo. And then also <laughs> also the shooting. So Alfred Russell Wallace still needed to have the birds shot. And now you see the this incredible uh, camera equipment in the, in, in the camo gear. And so the pairing um, of those actions is quite clear here too.
go from expected to extraordinary in the blink of an eye. You're awestricken. They transform themselves to something that you've never seen before. They swagger and serenade. They dance and display. They're unlike any creatures on Earth and one of the most astounding phenomena ever witnessed. The birds of paradise. Found here in the nearly impenetrable mountains and valleys of the island of New Guinea, in the greatest remaining tract of rainforest in the entire Asia Pacific region, they exist nowhere else on Earth. Vast, vast majority of the, of the land around here uh, has no road access. You're just looking up into a wall of steep slope, and you can tell that this is just ridge after ridge and valley after valley. Evolutionary biologist Ed Scholes and wildlife photographer Tim Lehman have spent the better part of a decade trekking into this isolated wilderness in pursuit of all 39 species of these miraculous birds. Well, the only way to see a king bird of paradise is to climb up into the trees where they live, so I'm heading up to my platform. They've been photographing, analyzing, and recording their every move, every behavior, in an attempt to comprehend their secrets. And in doing so, revealing extreme examples of the miracle of evolution. Birds of Paradise represent one of these singular events of evolution that stand out, that are extraordinary. They're something that's without precedent, something that evolved, that's so unique and so exceptional that you're driven to, to say, you know, why? Or, you know, how did that, how did that happen? How did that come to be? of paradise are remarkable not only for their exceptional beauty and almost otherworldly appearance, but as veritable living textbooks on adaptation and sexual selection. The females are looking at this whole package and can discern something about him by minor variation. The more complex it is, the harder it is to make it look right. You know, if one little feature is out of whack, you're going to be able to tell. What about New Guinea? has led to these birds evolving here and nowhere else. What function do their outrageous plumes and ornaments play? And what exactly are they doing? For me, it still always goes back to the, the original driving question, you know, and that's, how did it happen? How did the birds of paradise come to be? Witness diverse strategies of evolution at work and experience one of nature's most extraordinary hidden wonders up close. A world where beauty and behavior are intertwined. A spectacle not possible any other place on Earth. Right, so the pile of fruit is uh, <laughs> replaced by the pile of equipment here. Um, but we worked actually, we actually worked with um, Ed Scholes um, in the. 
do are we? Yeah. <laughs> okay, go on. Um, I, I think there's an amazing refrain of the Wallace quote um, when he's describing why they need to see the secrets of the birds, right? Only our cameras can capture this, only we can get here. And evolution becomes a kind of password for a scientific voyeurism that it was for Wallace and that it is also for Attenborough. But in the collection then, you can then, this produces a sort of much different kind of thing than the London Zoo, which is a sort of database subjectivity where you can then look up the bird and see its map and read their thing about it. And you get this sort of um, taxonomy that is, that is highly digitalized. So you can then click through where have you seen the video and there's a, like a really um, overdetermined interactivity of that kind of representation, which I think is a kind of post-cinematic database uh, specimen. Um, and I think we can talk about those three moments later of how, how that's changed. But it's also a super interesting question that relates to what you also brought up. The, they say it brings it up close, right? But who is really close? Just the two and then the, it's, a whole, it's a mediatization apparatus that um, is not close at all. And in, in the age of internet nature videos, there's a whole question, like the, the exposure to, to nature through these clips. Um, but so we worked with Tim and Ed in the context of the Jakarta exhibition where um, we uh, paired the specimens, um, the dead specimens, with audio recordings that they also collected, um, which you can access freely on the Cornell uh, Ornithology Labs page in that database. And so you could, you could kind of look at the uh, display cases while uh, hearing this live sound, and we were interested in what does that do in terms of um, the dead object and then and the and the live attempt a time based exposure or encounter. But, so I mean I think it's important to say that like while that kind of I don't think it's sufficient to just play the video and let it critique itself of this sort of man climbing tree with giant massive <laughs> telescope and camouflage um, that. There is a really important role that those projects play in terms of conservation and in terms of scientific endeavor, but then the sort of um, masculinization of that presentation, the sort of man in nature, not geographic kind of thing, and the sort of database subjectivity, I mean, we're both trying to be aware of that and also utilize it. So in the example of, of utilizing the audio, of course, that's trying to then break down that narrative of we just capture this and we get it, but that's in the legacy of the dead birds. And so really interested in how that, how you can kind of uh, disentangle some of the cleanliness of the, the database subjectivity through different forms of narration. So in a very recent uh, workshop we did in the summer, um, with uh, the ornithologist um, uh, Frank uh, Steinheimer, uh, seen here in the Berlin Natural History Museum, we asked if he would take their massive collection and curate a minor ornithology of what his interpretation of that would be into that con con context. Yeah, the brief was, can you tell us um, stories, can you single out stories of man-bird relations that would be particularly interesting um, in this huge repository of birds. Um, and he selected six specimens. And so um, for this is the parrot uh, owned by Humboldt. Um, and so he, and, and uh, this story was about speech and the conversations that Humboldt and the parrot had together. Um, this story about the great og from um, Iceland is another story of um, very fast extinction, kind of like the pa passenger pigeons or the dodo the, um, as well, um, and a variety of other specimens. Um, these totally mangled objects were uh, rescued after a bombing of the institution in the Second World War, where the birds were catapulted by the force of the detonation. The specimens were catapulted through um, the glass windows, and Ernst Stresemann an important ornithologist collected these um, destroyed objects. And so for us, the, we had already researched about these two um, palace tits um, 
from <laughs> from um, uh, Siberia. They are the oldest specimens that the museum has. They are from the late 18th century. But um, they are so interesting because they have kind of experienced a double death, you could say. So it's a taxi. They, they are resurrected as a taxidermy, and then they die again, and somebody brings them back. Nevertheless, um, what I want to say with this project, it was an experiment to work with Frank here um, in a conversation of, well, how do you activate these collections without, what do you need to do? Actually, you don't really need to do very much at all. You bring somebody who's knowledgeable, um, intimate, who has an intimate relation with these objects, and you allow him the space to um, move quite freely through, um, through that collection and tell the stories. So you don't need to bring, you don't necessarily need to bring a bunch of artists, have them have a two-week residency and then implement a kind of a foreign thing into there in order to make that, make that more, um, more, vi more, make that move better or something. But it was all already there for us in that, in that um, I think we'll collaboration. Um, so I guess just for in the interest of time so we can have lunch, we just pa we'll just pause it here. We have a few other reflections on necroaesthetics and how they would play into a, some contemporary work, some other things that we're working on, some provocations for you guys. Um, but in this sort of three moments of collecting and capturing and rendering in high resolution, I suppose, uh, as a sort of database subjectivity, I think that the, for us, this, this question of how the bird of paradise becomes a necroaesthetic object, a sort of a fantasy object that is keeping pace with the technological capacity of its representation. Mm -hmm. um, and so because it is so, I mean, as you see, it's so exquisite that the ability to then render it, reanimate it, is at the cutting edge of that technology. So whether that's taxidermy uh, and uh, mm -hmm. arsenic soap and taxidermy posing or the cinematic representation and the collecting into capturing into the zoo or which is now why go to the zoo as you said when you can watch this high def in there climbing and through everything and you don't need to go anywhere you just put it on YouTube and watch these bird sex all day long you know they have all 39 <laughs> sex, sex mating rituals that you can watch and try for yourself and so there's, there's like a very different uh, sort of YouTube database subjectivity that that, that necroaesthetics is articulated in. But I think in those three examples, uh, for us, you can find a really interesting uh, sequence of mediation that, that speaks to the garden. Um, particularly the, the bestiary at the same time. Yeah, mm -hmm. but I mean, the gar I think the garden is quite interesting because it's the birds of paradise. So paradise is only imagined as a garden. Then when we see New Guinea put in its context, it's certainly not the garden, this e Edenic garden. But um, I think also this, of course, uh, the theatricality and the, the capture questions are quite interesting. So maybe we leave it there. We certainly there. Up, uh, start again with that, uh, too, uh, for the conversation. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you.